All right, we are going to officially begin today's events. So if you haven't already grabbed a seat, please do so. I would like to uh, welcome everyone to the High Weekly Research Seminar. I'm Nestor Masley. I'm the research manager at Stanford High and the editor for the AI Index. And as someone who's worked on this project for the last three months, I'm very excited to finally share it with you guys. And I, I really firmly believe that the AI Index is one of the best resources for tracking and understanding trends in AI. And today I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker, Ray Perot, that is going to guide you through these trends. So along with co-chairing the publication of the AI Index, Ray is a distinguished computer scientist at SRI International, which is an independent nonprofit research institute that's located in Menlo Park. At SRI, Ray supports business development and special projects in the information and computing sciences division. From 1988 to 2017, he led SRI's Artificial Intelligence Center. And before SRI, Ray was a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto and was also a founding principal at the Center for the Study of Language and Information right here at Stanford University. Now, in today's seminar, Ray is going to discuss the findings of the 2023 AI Index report. So the AI index is currently in its sixth year, and it tracks, collates, distills, and visualizes data relating to artificial intelligence. And the AI index really exists to provide data for policymakers, researchers, journalists, executives, and the general public, basically anybody that wants to develop a deeper understanding of the complex field of AI. Now, before we begin, uh, a couple of logistical details. So for our Zoom audience, you can use the Zoom chat to message the group, but we ask that you guys ans uh, pose your questions. So if you have questions, please pose them through Slido. And you can click on the link that will be up in the chat shortly. Uh, Slido also has a nice upvote feature, which will help the team at high prioritize questions. And after the presentation, we'll be switching off between questions from our live audience and questions from our virtual audience. So we're going to have roughly 45 minutes to present and then 15 minutes for questions. With all that said, uh, I will give the floor over to Ray for our presentation. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for uh, showing up. My apologies to you who came specifically to hear my colleague, Jack Clark. Uh, I won't pretend to either his charm or his deep knowledge of some parts of AI. And uh, you're going to have to put up with my Canadian accent. Uh, my objective today is to go over the highlights of the 2023 report, uh, now in its sixth edition. There's way more material uh, in the report than I can do justice to here. And I'll consider myself to have been successful uh, if I can interest you in reading at least some bit of it. Uh, the uh, index is an annual project to assess and measure AI's technical progress, related ethical issues, impact on the economy, uh, evolution of the related labor force, starting with the educational system, uh, and actions from policymakers in relation from the general public. And I'll talk about all these areas a little bit. The project is managed by a steering committee uh, chaired by Jack and me. Uh, the heavy lifting was done by our research manager, Nestor, uh, who's done an amazing job of interacting with our many collaborators and producing the document, uh, supported by Loredana Fattorini, our chief data wrangler. Um, this year, we've increased the portion of the report that's based on uh, data and analyses prepared by AI Index staff, uh, contractors, and students. Uh, and these contributions appear throughout the report, um, but especially in the sections on AI ethics and policy and governance. Uh, there, uh, I will not be pointing them out specifically here, but again, all of this is well documented. 
the report wouldn't be possible without the help of our many collaborators who contribute data and analysis to various parts. And again, uh, I won't be acknowledging most of them as we go through, but it's all well documented. So let's start with technical performance. Uh, this was, of course, the year uh, with the most releases uh, so far of large generative uh, AI models applied to a wide variety of tasks and domains, including language, imagery, and programming, mostly originating with U.S. companies, uh, but some from Europe, uh, as uh, is the case with Bloom, uh, and some from China, as in GLM 130B. Uh, some of these are private, uh, that is, they're not available to the open public, and some of them uh, are publicly available. Uh, Epic AI created a database of machine le learning systems going back to the 1950s, and we singled out 38 of these uh, in 2022 that we call significant ML systems. They include uh, large language models, foundation models, transformers, um, reinforcement learning systems, and so on. Most are trained on language, uh, imagery, and a combination of the two. The um, size of these models is growing exponentially, and their origin uh, is shifting from academia, which are the blue dots on this, uh, on this chart, to industry, which are the purple dots. And for those of you who are interested in the history of AI, Samuel's Checker Player, the uh, best known early machine learning model, uh, is right in the bottom left in the, uh, in the early 50s. Uh, this is another view of the uh, origin of these systems showing the increasing dominance uh, of, of, interest, of interest industry in their generation. Geographically, uh, most of these systems are from US firms. Uh, followed by the UK and the EU, uh, and then by China. Uh, the AI index has estimated the cost of training large models. The x-axis here is time, uh, then the y-axis is estimated cost. Uh, the pale blue bars are ones where we're most comfortable with our estimates, and the purple ones where we think we may be a little high, the dark blue ones where we may be a little low. Uh, the largest of these models cost in the millions of dollars, which puts them out of the reach of most academic groups. Uh, but there's much work going on to reduce the cost of new models, including some recent work done here at Stanford. Uh, the costs are still within the reach of large non-tech companies. So we're seeing the release of special purpose models uh, in, in targeted at particular domains, such as finance and bioscience. Uh, the AI index tracks the performance of AI systems on a large number of benchmarks. And this chart shows uh, both year over year and overall improvement relative to a benchmark's first uh, appearance. So red is year over year and blue is overall progress. Um, the <coughs> the um, uh, systems are, or the benchmarks are uh, divided up into uh, vision, uh, static images, uh, video, language, uh, speech recognition, and uh, reinforcement learning. Several benchmarks are showing saturation, um, ImageNet top one, SuperGlue, and Squad in particular. Uh, and uh, this is being uh, reacted to by the community by releasing uh, harder uh, benchmarks uh, to accommodate both a broader range of tasks, more multimodal tasks, uh, and more joint testing of accuracy and, ethic, uh, and ethics metrics uh, like bias and toxicity. So one area where there's still progress being made uh, is in deepfake detection. Uh, CelebDF is presently the most challenging deepfake uh, detecting, uh, detection benchmark or one of them. Uh, this data set is composed of almost 600 original celebrity YouTube videos. Um, uh, that's, that have been uh, manipulated uh, into thousands of deep fakes. And this year's top deep fake detection algorithm uh, on this benchmark comes from uh, a university in Australia. 
Another way to escape benchmark saturation is to test the same system across a range of tasks. So in 2022, uh, several uh, models were introduced. For example, BEIT3 from Microsoft and uh, uh, Pally from Google that posted state-of-the-art results across a wide variety of both vision and language benchmarks. So this, uh, for example, at the time of publication of the BIT3 paper, uh, they posted state-of-the-art results on four different vision skills and five different uh, vision language skills, so all done with the same, uh, with the same system. Another new benchmark, the uh, massive multitask language understanding, uh, evaluates models in zero-shot or few-shot settings across 57 subjects uh, in the humanities, STEM, and the social sciences. So this is some examples um, of high school math questions uh, in, the, uh, in the benchmark. And uh, this is an example of uh, some economics, microeconomics questions from the, uh, from the benchmark. And uh, Gopher, uh, Chinchilla, and variants of the Palm system have each posted uh, state-of-the-art results uh, on this benchmark. And the current top result uh, comes from a variant of Palm, uh, a Google model that uh, reports an average score of 75%. There's ample anecdotal evidence from experiments with large models that they can experience difficulty with reasoning, particularly with tasks that seem to require generalization to something like symbolic rules. And one area in which this is particularly evident uh, is in planning. And a group at Arizona State released a planning benchmark based on the blocks world. Uh, they ran experiments with three large language models uh, that show that at least for the four or five tasks at the top here, uh, there is much progress uh, that still needs to be made in this area. There's increasing concern about the environmental impact of training large systems. A group in Europe released an estimate of the carbon footprint of Bloom, a 176 billion parameter model. Um, they argue that although it has a greater footprint than 25 passenger trips across the US, uh, that that footprint is already much smaller than that of some models uh, that preceded it, uh, even some larger ones. So the uh, bars at the top uh, show um, carbon emissions in, in tons. The Bloom benchmark is the green, the small green line about fourth from the bottom. Um, and, uh, so, and, and some other comparable metrics uh, like a human life um, are, uh, are shown here for, uh, for comparison. So because of the correlation between cost and footprint, uh, reducing the footprint of new models is tremendously important, not only for the environment, but also because it would allow groups with fewer resources to be able to train their own. But the relationship between AI and the environment isn't all bad. Uh, DeepMind developed a reinforcement learning based model to control energy use in data centers uh, that resulted in a significant uh, energy decrease after only a few months. AI has been applied to other scientific pursuits uh, such as controlling nuclear fusion in a tokamak reactor, uh, designing new antibodies, and discovering new matrix multiplication algorithms. And NVIDIA claims that it's been able to reduce the size of chips by 25% using uh, uh, reinforcement learning to optimize their designs. So now we move on to ethical questions re uh, related to the use of these systems. They're becoming more prominent, and this has become an area of research of its own. Uh, the AI algorithmic and automation incidents and controversies repository has been developed to record incidents uh, concerning the misuse of AI. Um, these include uh, deep fakes, uh, the uh, monitoring of prison calls, uh, copyright violation in uh, image models, and so on. 
the number of these recorded incidents has increased by uh, 26 times over a decade and 20% year over year. Fact, the leading conference on AI ethics uh, has seen its submissions more than doubled uh, year over year. Uh, most of these are from academia, but submissions from industry have tripled. It's been previously reported that larger uh, LLMs were more accurate, but also more biased. Uh, but this depends on how the models are trained. Uh, the blue bars here are models that have uh, used instruction tuning, uh, and they do much better on bias than those that have not uh, as measured on the uh, winnow gender task. Uh, biased in, bias in generated images is now quite well known. Uh, these are responses from mid-journey to the prompts influential person or intelligent person. Uh, almost all the images generated are white males. Um, stable diffusion produces similar results uh, even when the prompts add qualities that one might think, and maybe in a sexist way, uh, would have it lean more towards women, such as a CEO who's pleasant versus a CEO who's aggressive. Um, the results are about the same. The chart on the left shows that fairness on the y-axis uh, improves with accuracy of the, of the models on the um, x-axis. But experiments shown uh, by the Stanford Helm team show that that relation uh, to gender bias uh, in the right chart is much less clear. Uh, these trade-offs obviously need to be considered before uh, any broad deployment. Moving on to the economy, the demand for AI skills uh, in the US labor force continues to increase. The proportion of all job postings uh, on LinkedIn that relate to AI is up from 1.7 to 1.9% year over year. And the sectors showing the highest demand are uh, information, uh, professional, scientific, and technical services, uh, finance and assurance, and manufacturing. 2022 was the first year in a decade when private investment in AI firms decreased 27% year over year. Uh, 2021 had been a blowout year, um, and 2022 is more in line um, with the past, still 18 times the uh, amounts from 2013. The US continues to lead private investment. Uh, in 2022, the US uh, invested uh, three and a half times more than China. In 2022, the AI focus with the most investment was medical and healthcare, uh, followed by data management, processing and cloud, uh, and FinTech. Companies report using AI both to reduce costs and to increase revenues. Uh, areas for cost reduction include supply chain management and operations, and increased revenues are claimed to follow investments in marketing and sales and product and service deployment. With respect to which areas of AI are most deployed, the main ones are vision, uh, natural language processing, robotics, and virtual agents. Companies adopting AI in at least one function, the proportion of the companies surveyed adopting AI, uh, has actually been flat. Uh, and um, th this has been the case since 2018. This is a bit of a mystery to me, um, but certainly of, uh, of a continuing uh, interest. Year over year, adoption by companies has shrunk overall. Um, this is, again, 2022 over 2021. Uh, it's most stable in North America and in Europe, uh, but falling back quite significantly in the rest of the world. GitHub surveyed users uh, of its co-pilot programming assistance system, and uh, they say that it makes them feel more productive and more satisfied. Now we move to education. Um, the number of new US PhD graduates specializing in AI continues to increase, uh, reaching 19%. Um, in 2011, 
academia and industry hired about the same number of PhDs. Uh, now two times more uh, go to industry. New faculty hiring in computer science and related departments has been flat for several years and uh, has uh, decreased in 2020 and 2021. Interest in K-12 computer science education is growing as shown here in the number of US students taking the CS uh, AP exam. About 180,000 did so in 2021. Policymakers around the world are developing national AI strategies. Uh, 62 countries have done so uh, now, starting with Canada, uh, China, and Finland. The US joined in 2019, and a few more join every year. Uh, AI index surveyed legislation concerning uh, AI bills passed in 127 countries. Uh, 31 countries have, have uh, passed at least one AI-related bill, and 37 were passed uh, in 2022, including nine in the US. The number of bills concerning AI in the US has grown rapidly since 2016, but relatively few, uh, few get passed. Uh, there was a bit of an uptick in 2022. Um, bills are being passed in the states. Um, Maryland, Massachusetts, California, and uh, Washington lead the states, and there are 24 states that have yet to pass anything. Use of facial recognition, development of mixed reality classrooms, applications to climate change, uh, providing government services, uh, and state codes of ethics are among the issues uh, covered in state legislation. Uh, the in AI index surveyed mentions of AI in legislative procedures, uh, proceedings in 81 countries. Uh, the uh, number has gone up by over six times uh, since 2016. We've started investigating government spending on AI, starting in the US. Uh, analyses of government agency budgets, uh, which are plans to spend money, they're future looking. Uh, are roughly consistent with the analysis, an analysis of government contracting, uh, which records funds actually spent. So shown here is actual government spending uh, in AI areas since 2017, uh, broken down by sub areas of AI. The total spending is going up and was above $3 billion in 2022. The AI index has started investigating the prominence of legal cases related to AI in the US. We've found over 100 such cases in 2022, up six times since 2016. And the states with the highest number of these cases are California, Illinois, uh, New York, and not surprisingly, Delaware. Uh, these are dominated by civil law cases, uh, but with several IP contracts and competition cases as well. Moving on to diversity uh, of the US AI related workforce. Uh, North American CS PhD students are gradually becoming more diverse. The portion of blacks and Hispanics is growing, uh, how, however, slowly, uh, and each has passed 4%. The transition is more notable among bachelor's level students where the portion of white students has decreased by half in 10 years. The proportion of new women AI PhD graduates uh, stubbornly remains at about 20%. Uh, this is uh, one of the great disappointing slides here. But women have now cracked the 30% barrier among hiring of new faculty in computer science and AI. Uh, and in high schools, the proportion of women taking AP computer science classes or computer science exams uh, is now above 30% in most states. Uh, looking into public opinion. So there are two global surveys, uh, one by Ipsos and one jointly done by Lloyd's Register and Gallup, 
and one US-based survey done by Pew Research. Uh, unfortunately, there's very little longitudinal uh, information available about uh, opinions on AI. So these are all uh, 2022 uh, static reports. So one survey asked respondents from various countries whether they thought they would, uh, they would see more benefits or more drawbacks from AI. Respondents from China were overwhelmingly on the side of new benefits, of more benefits. And those from the US, uh, way down at the bottom, saw many more drawbacks. In the Lloyd survey, uh, men are more positive than women about the value of AI products and services. And women are somewhat more likely to believe that AI will do more harm than to help. The Lloyd's Gallup poll found a surprisingly negative worldwide opinion on the safety of self-driving cars, with two-thirds of the respondents saying that they would not feel safe in one of them. Uh, this is from the Pew survey in the US. Uh, each bar denotes one issue broken down into negative opinion in blue, positive in purple. Um, the top bar is about facial recognition, uh, and the bottom bar is about uh, self-driving cars. So in the US, uh, we more would accept wider use of facial recognition uh, technology than of self-driving cars. The middle bar asks about whether social media providers should use algorithms to detect false information, and opinions here are clearly mixed. Uh, Pew asked Americans what their concerns about AI were, uh, and the respondents are much more concerned about loss of jobs and the use of surveillance than they are about bias. A survey of 480 natural language processing researchers, 68% uh, of whom had uh, authored uh, an ACL publication, or two actually, two ACL publications in the last few years. 77% uh, of the respondents feel that private firms have too much influence on the field, and 86% that it will publish the most cited research. And curiously, 67% feel that natural language processing is based on dubious science. The vast majority feel that NLP's impact has been and will continue to be positive, uh, but 40% feel that it should be regulated. Uh, last section is on research and development. Uh, so we now turn to looking at uh, publications in AI. Uh, jointly with CSET, our partner in this area, uh, we decided that as of a few weeks ago, we were not sufficiently confident in the numbers available for 2022 to include them in this report. So what we present in this section is a slight update uh, of what was in the uh, previous report in 2022 which has data only to the end of 2021. So this chart shows the total number of AI-related publications worldwide uh, with a significant increase starting in 2017. The proportion of AI uh, publications in journals and in uh, repositories, i.e. in archive, uh, continues to rise. And I suspect that this is a consequence of the interest, the increasing participation of researchers from uh, engineering as opposed to computer science, where journals are the dominant form of publication um, as opposed to the computer scientists, which who are more conference oriented. 75% of the publications come from universities, uh, but the proportion from industry is increasing. Looking at the number of journal publications uh, by geographical area, China continues to lead uh, with twice as many as the, uh, in the EU uh, combined with the UK, uh, which is in turn 50% higher than the US. And these ratios are not far from those uh, of the populations of these, uh, of these geographic areas. And there's a significant increase in publications coming from India. Uh, China has been leading since 2017 in the number of 
uh, citations to journal articles. Uh, with respect to conference publications, the US, uh, China, and the EU are now very close. Uh, Archive is now a major venue for AI publications, uh, including many from industry that are not submitted to journals. Uh, China's use of archive is increasing, but is uh, not nearly as much as uh, in the US. Uh, the uh, US dominates when it comes to citation uh, to repository publications. Uh, one hunch here is that um, many of the papers announcing the release of large, new large models from industry are posted on archive and they get a lot of, uh, a lot of recognition. To end on a, well, not quite to end. Um, so CSET has calculated a measure of the collaboration between two countries, which is simply the number of papers published with um, co-authors from, uh, from different, from the two countries. So this chart shows the number of collaborations between the US and China, which has gradually increased, although it appears to be plateauing, though at a quite high level, because we're now we're talking about, about 10,000 publications a year. Uh, in 2021, China had as many collaborations with the UK as uh, did the US and uh, more with Australia. Uh, this is one of the new sets of charts from CSET this year uh, concerning AI publications by aggregated by institution. So across AI, all but one of the top 10 institutions um, are from China. The only non-Chinese institution in here is the last one, which is MIT. Now these numbers are roughly proportional to the size of these institutions. MIT has about a thousand faculty and 7,500 graduate students all, all together. While Tsinghua University uh, is three times uh, the size with 3,500 faculty and 18,000 students. And Tsinghua shows with twice the number of publications of MIT. In computer vision, all top 10 institutions are Chinese. But only half of the uh, leading institutions in natural language processing uh, are, um, are Chinese, uh, where CMU with about 1,500 staff and 8,500 grad students, uh, so about half the size of Tsinghua has about the same number of publications. So we hope to release an updated version of this chapter later on in the year. So that's it. Um, I uh, thank you again for coming. I hope that I've uh, interested you enough in uh, having a look at the, uh, so that you'll go have a look at the report uh, if you haven't done so yet. Uh, thanks again to our collaborators and our sponsors. Uh, and do send us your comments, uh, good or bad. We are very much interested. Thank you uh, very much, Ray. And to echo what Ray said, the report is only a short 386 pages. So you can uh, bring it with you on your next vacation and power through it um, on the beach. So uh, we'll do some questions now. Uh, for the audience in person, we would ask that you line up at the microphone at the front. Uh, we have quite a few questions from our online audience. So we'll start there and then we'll go with the in-person audience. So. The first question that I'll pose to you, Ray, concerns reasoning in large language models. And I know that's a topic that is of great interest to you. One of the attendees asks, uh, progress in large language models is sometimes seen as first sparks of artificial general intelligence. And as such, large language models are scaled. However, most are still bad at math. Where do we stand on reasoning and planning in the domain of large language models and AI more broadly? Yeah, uh, so excellent and important question. Um, 
again, there, uh, I mean, you mentioned math. Um, there, I think it's, it's quite well known that uh, any of these large langu language models will do fine on, say, uh, addition uh, with numbers that are within the bounds of the numbers they've seen in their training set. But if you significantly increase the size of these numbers, then the performance of the system goes down. Uh, the other thing that's a bit of a challenge is if you ask the same system, uh, the, and if you ask it to do an addition several times, you may get different answers, which is not great. Um, now, um, one of the things that I find, uh, I have to say, extremely uh, interesting about what lies in the future is that a lot of these language models have announced APIs and they've announced connections to systems that can be used uh, to do reasoning. So in particular, there's a link between, I believe, ChatGPT uh, and uh, the Wolfram uh, Alpha system uh, that is a database of reasoning about physics and large amounts of data. Uh, that's existed for decades now. Um, and so one, uh, one challenge here is, will these large language models learn to correctly uh, interrogate reasoning models on the side and take those results and integrate them uh, into, their, uh, into their processes? I think we're just beginning to see this uh, this is not the dream of the uh, inventors of these models who would like to see all of the knowledge of the system come from experience because they're, these syst systems they're talking to uh, are clearly uh, human engineered. Um, but it would still be a, um, uh, a, a allow for uh, uh, combining the incredible fluency of the language models with uh, reasoning capabilities from the side, but they have to get a, they have to get the transfer uh, right. I know that in the with Wolfram Alpha, you can actually ask it to use Wolfram Alpha. Uh, that's not quite the right answer. <laughs> you you would like this to happen automatically. Uh, anyway, I suspect we'll see more of that uh, in the in the near future. We also have a question about geopolitical relations between the United States and China from our online audience. Can you talk about how U.S. and China political tension may impact collaborative AI research? Um, we are clearly seeing restrictions on the movement of uh, Chinese students and scholars uh, into um, uh, U.S. universities. Um, it's still quite difficult for uh, Chinese uh, to visit here. I attended a, um, a major the AAAI conference uh, recently. Half the papers um, that had been uh, accepted uh, were from China and there were no Chinese in the audience. Um, they simply couldn't get in for various reasons. So there are, you know, there are clearly limitations uh, on, uh, on interactions. Um, it's a, I, I won't go into the political issues of why that's the case and what should be done about it, but it's clearly having an impact uh, on, uh, on interactions. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if when we finally saw 2022 results that, that this number of collaborations went down. I think we have a first uh, in-person question, so go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the comments. Um, you, you mentioned that um, somewhat curious results in industry where about 50% of departments are uh, sort of st stuck uh, in using that, and that's been stable for a couple of years. I was wondering if you had any hypotheses about what was driving that and if it's sort of like a failure of figuring out how to use them or, or what might be going on and how to get unstuck. Yeah, um, I, I think this is a difficult question. Um, as our sources don't address it explicitly. Uh, I've asked uh, some people at Stanford what their experience had been. Uh, the answer I get from here is, 
um, when we're not hiring, it's because we can't find the right candidates, not because, you know, they aren't out there. Um, you know, it, it's a, uh, there is, I believe in the report, a chart of how, what departments say about their hiring or their lack of ability to hire. Uh, and the dominant factor is they can't find the right people. I mean, they're just not out there. Uh, now, some part of that, of course, could be driven by the fact that you take, you know, half the graduating class and you send them to industry and they're not even applying, right? Um, and uh, so that, you know, may well have a, you know, have a significant impact on how we're prepared to uh, train the next generation. I'll combine a couple of questions from our online audience that concern environmental trends in AI. So there's a couple of questions that are asking about just tangibly, like how do large language models and how do AI systems actually contribute to CO2 emissions? So that's kind of question number one on that point. And then the second question is, are model footprints calculations only about training? Does the AI index include estimates for the environmental impact of inference and deployment? Okay, so the um, the first question, um, the, the training of these models requires a lot of compute. Uh, compute requires power. Um, power um, is generated in various ways. Um, the more compute you use, the more power you use, and the more CO2 you release. Um, again, as I, as I mentioned, there's significant work on trying to improve the uh, efficacy of, uh, of training. And we're now seeing, um, I mean, some of this work is, is kind of purely algorithmic, how to make the, how to make the, uh, uh, the gradient descent, the, uh, algorithm work more efficiently. Uh, but there is also some work on uh, how to refine models that already exist to improve their performance without having to retrain them completely. And I think that's a, you know, that, that would be an area in which you can get better performance with less, um, uh, with less CO2 uh, consequences. Let's do the in-person question. Hello. Um, I was intrigued by the uh, the researchers' belief that NLP is based on dubious science. Just wondering if you could provide some insight into what's happening. I, I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. Um, I, I don't believe it's in the survey. It would be purely speculative. I would say, though, that I think that paper is linked in the index. So if you do want to read the paper itself, I don't, I can't recall if they go into that topic in greater detail in the paper in and of itself, but it's all linked in the index. Uh, another question from our online audience, and I think this is a good one. What advice would you give to students interested in pursuing a career in AI? And what skills do you think are most important for success in the field? Math. Do math. Do as much math as you can. Um, then there's some programming skills that you that you will need, but my sense is if you want to be in the in the uh, the research end of it, um, there is more math than there ever was. Um, you know, I came into uh, AI in the ice ages, um, and uh, I know way less math than you know any of you who are doing it now. Um, the more you have, the better. The programming will come. I think that's the easy part. So another question here regarding different types of software in the world of AI. Does the AI index show any trends regarding the use of proprietary versus open source models? So I don't know the answer to that. We do have a section um tracking the use of various systems on github and i don't know whether we split them into proprietary and 
and open. I mean, I presume most of the stuff that's on GitHub is open source because Google probably doesn't put its secrets on GitHub. Uh, so I may have just answered the question. I think um, in commenting on that, I would say yeah, we do have information in the report on GitHub. Yeah, so trends in open source adoption of different kind of AI systems. Uh, and I think that was a new point of data that we included this year because we felt it was important to capture that. But moving forward in the future, we would like to track the degree to which large language models that are released are perhaps open source or behind closed doors because that seems increasingly important. Let's go to our audience member here. Hi, let's see. Can you hear me? I'm, I'm shorter, so just want to make sure. Um, okay, so I actually have two questions. Um, so going back to the point around reasoning in large language models, um, you mentioned that, I guess I just have a question around like what you think kind of the primary challenge to be solved there is. You mentioned this idea of like connections between large language models and existing systems for reasoning. Um, is it is is that kind of the primary challenge, or is it also developing new ways of reasoning and new reasoning techniques? Um, and then the other question is: I think if I read the report right, there was um, uh, there's basically this idea that there are more there's more research now being done in industry. Um, than there was versus academia. Um, so first of all, I don't, I don't, I think that's what I, I saw in the chart there. And and if so, I'm curious what you think the implications of that are. Okay, um, reasoning then research. So um, I think, I mean, one way I've seen this described is that um, large language models learn to interpolate. They don't learn to generalize in the sense that they don't learn to produce representations which they can then use autonomously in new settings. So um, roughly arithmetic works if you've seen a lot of examples of roughly these numbers in your, in your training set and it doesn't work when you do anything else. And if you're trying to get it to use you know, an equation physics equation to solve a problem, um, I think even if it had seen this equation in its training set, it wouldn't know how to use it. Now, another, of course, possibility, and as a way to go forward here, is that there's been work on uh, having machine learning systems learn to generalize. Uh, there's a whole field called inductive logic programming. Uh, which I believe is, you know, is now being considered as a way of using this, uh, of of solving this, of solving this problem. Uh, but it's a very different approach, and it's not clear that you could uh, use it simply by having the um, uh, in, information about this just in the training set, in the language training set of the uh, of the model. Um, now, <clears throat> one of the things that also strikes me is there are a lot of these symbolic manipulation uh, questions that as humans, we don't learn by just observing a bunch of examples, right? Your mother probably taught you to add numbers. And um, she did, you, you did examples and you did short examples and then you kind of got it and you could do longer examples. Um, and what you were taught was the rule, not the instances. Um, so somewhere in there, it seems to me, you know, something like this needs to happen. And, you know, lots of people have talked about this in, uh, in, uh, in great detail. Um, and question is, will this all happen within the same framework or will it happen uh, by cobbling together various pieces uh, trained elsewhere? And I must say, although in some ways I'm a purist, I would not object to solutions that require cobbling things together. I mean, I think if we could make progress like that, that way, we should start with that and then look for better ends. Okay, second question. Oh, the second question was um, that my understanding was there's basically this increasing number of uh, research now being done in industry versus yeah. academia, and what are the implications? Well. So, 
Most papers are still published. I mean, way more papers are still published in, in academia for the good reason that students have to publish papers if they're going to get a job. So that's the way the system goes. Um, and as a employee of a corporation, you're, that, may, that may influence your progress, but it's not what you're primarily there to do. Um, also that of course, industry doesn't, doesn't want to or can't uh, publish a lot of its, uh, of its results. Uh, universities have to, universities you know, basically can't do work that's not publishable. So that the incentives are quite different. Thank you. One question from the online audience on how you square or whether you have an opinion on the fact that it seems like the amount of industry adoption of AI technology, as you suggested in that chart, seems to be plateauing. Yet over time, we seem to be seeing more and more AI investments. How do you square that or make sense of that? Yeah. Um, the investment, of course, is um, is largely forward looking. Right? You put money in a startup not because you think that you're going to make money this year or next year, but because somewhere down the road something big is going to happen. Um, and you don't necessarily, in fact, I think much of the time, uh, you aren't sure how your investments are going to bear fruit because there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done to get there. Um, now, the companies surveyed with respect to their adoption are, I think, mostly large companies that are already in some, you know, they're in some industry, they're doing something. And the question is more, how are they going to adapt or improve their processes by uh, throwing a bit of AI uh, in it in, in, in various ways. Um, so they will try things out. Um, they will run experiments. Some of them will work. Some of them will not work. Um, and the amount that they can afford to invest in it may depend on, you know, in a given year, uh, how well they're doing. So it's not, um, it, it's not surprising that there are fluctuations. Um, and my guess is the, the flatness of the of the overall chart uh, is that there are companies that are you know largely waiting to see what the results, what the good outcomes uh, turn out to be, and who will jump in uh, once it's been done or when they can buy it. Uh, so there's a you know in industry there's a big build versus buy uh, question all the time. Um, and uh, so some companies are there to develop products which they will then sell, and some companies develop stuff that they will use on their own and um, you know, not make generally available or even sell as a product. They, it's, it's ancillary to their, to their activity. Sue, uh, audience question. Uh, hello. I have a question about the job market. So it seemed like there's um, there's some growing demand for AI centric jobs, uh, but at the same time, uh, it sounded to me like there's also a gap in the skill set that's currently available. And um, do, do you think um, there could be some ways to smooth out that period of transitioning? And um, is that is that a danger potentially for the economy, or um, should there be tools like, for example, universal basic income that would smooth it over? Um, what's your uh, opinion on that? Yeah. Um, I mean, my, this is all completely speculative. Um, I mean, my guess is that people looking for AI jobs, uh, mostly have an easier time at it than, than others. Um, certainly if you look at universities, you know, they claim that they're, um, uh, supply limited. Um, I don't know that the surveys, the labor surveys we look at, uh, distinguish offer from demand. Um, you know, tell us much about how many people are actually hired of the people who of to fill the job posting. Um, you know, maybe that's something we could look into in the future. But as in all these markets, that's the question.
think we have time for one more question. And we'll take this one from the online audience. Uh, it was just posed, but it's getting a lot of action. What's your impression of safety concerns that appeared in the media with the release of GPT-4 relating to AI existential risk, uh, researcher acknowledgement and policy solutions? And perhaps more broadly, this is a question of safety concerns with how the field is trending in general. I was hoping we wouldn't get there. Um, so there clearly are safety concerns. Um, I think before the safety concerns, really, there are the, um, does the product work as advertised or not? Um, you know, you'd never buy a car or a drug that hadn't been uh, tested and certified. And, uh, so I, I think when we look at these, um, when we look at these systems, uh, if they're going to be broadly released, there should be some assurance that they will actually do what they're supposed to do. They're great fun and they're amazing. I mean, they really are amazing. And, and, you know, five, 10 years ago, most people didn't even dream that this was possible. And most AI people didn't think that this is what was going to hit the market. You know, this is not what people were after. It just kind of emerged. Um, but emergence and performance are not the same, are not the same thing. And although I use these things to do searches, um, you know, I never take the answer they give me without checking because, you know, much of the time they just don't work well. Enough. So how are we going to certify these systems? Uh, you know, how are we going to do this? I think that's a, that's a major, major question. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope we have more to report on about this next year. Well, thank you very much, Ray, for, for joining us for the presentation and for fielding all of these questions. Thank you. Bye. By thanking all of you that showed up in person and also our online audience. Also just wanted to give a special shout out to Vanessa who organizes these seminars, but actually led the effort on high to get the index out of the door. So shout out to her. And also a shout out to Laura Donna, who's sitting here in the front. She's our research associate, but she made every single chart that you saw today. And she made like 10 versions of every chart. So you do the math uh, in terms of how many charts she's made in the last uh, few months. And thank you again to Ray, not only for presenting, but for doing a stand-up job co-chairing this year's index. And to Jack Clark as well, who's not here. But thank you all. And we hope to see you at some of our future seminars. Take care.